Good morning, everybody. Welcome to CPI's Education Center PU 111 Regulatory Compliance Assistance Program Tool for Enhanced PRI Reporting for the Polyurethane Industry. I'm Lee Crinsman, your moderator and webinar organizer. Before we get started, I just have a few general announcements. First, this webinar is being recorded. Everyone is muted right now, but at the end of the presentation, I will unmute everyone and, our, and you will be able to ask our presenters any questions. Next, just a reminder, this is an ACC-sponsored webinar. We will not be discussing pricing, production, transportation, or market procedures. Additionally, I would like to remind everyone about CPI's new education center. It offers participants opportunities to gain critical insight and expertise on a number of technical and professional topics in the polyurethane industry. CPI's education center offers unmatched opportunities for participants to increase their knowledge of the polyurethane industry no matter where they are in their career. Our courses are designed to keep industry professionals on the top of the latest standards, trends, and developments by offering three convenient ways, webinars, professional development, and program courses, and we have on-demand courses which are now available. We have several planned webinars coming up. Uh, we have one in September, October, November, and December, uh, and this webinar will be available to everyone in a couple weeks. Just a friendly re reminder, CPI's annual technical conference is September 26th to 28th in Baltimore, Maryland. Registration is still open. I hope to see you all in Baltimore at the end of September. Okay, we can go ahead and get started. Today's panelists are Shen Tian from Covestro. Shen is an EHS engineer with product safety and regulatory affairs at Covestro. He is responsible for helping customers on emission modeling and reporting. Shen also performs exposure assessment using various regulatory models. Shen is a registered professional engineer and received his MS degrees from Carnegie Mellon and University of California. Bill Robert is also on the call with us today from BASF. Bill received his master's in occupational and environmental health from Wayne State University and became a certified industrial hygienist working for BASF Corporation Polyurethanes Group as a manager of product stewardship. He has been active product stewardship outreach to downstream users throughout various polyurethane trade groups, such as International Isocyanate Institute, the American, Council, American Chemistry Council Diocyanate Panel, Great Polyurethane Foam Association, and the Center for Polyurethane Industry. I'll hand it over to Bill. The, over the course outline. Okay. I guess that just means I've been around for a long time. Um, the course outline really is uh, trying to tell you the importance of reporting uh, the TRI and what happens when you don't, uh, the challenges in uh, MDI and CDI reporting. Shannon will do a really wonderful job in, in showing that, and he's really made some beautiful updates to this tool. And um, updates that uh, show the uh, uh, updates to the 2012 Regulatory Compliance Assistance Program, um, the 2016 tool validation in the flexible foam industry as an example, and um, the tool illustration. Next uh, slide. And we'll try to gain some insights into the TRI reporting requirements, try to get familiar with the recap uh, tool interface, um, try to be able to select the modules for your application and uh, understand the emission uh, mechanisms and algorithms that are, are set up in here, a little bit more updated and uh, a lot more user-friendly, and try to be prepared to collect uh, uh, facility-specific uh, data. Okay, the importance of the TI reporting requirements are that uh, um, in news releases from Region 1, at least, there's been settlements to ensure that three companies comply with the Public Right to Know Act. And um, out in, on the West Coast, the U.S. EPA required Cupertino Cement uh, Company to report toxic uh, chemicals and to commit to environmental reporting. Well, how they do that? Well, they uh, 
they have settlements with uh, with companies, and uh, this was with Lehigh Southwest Cement Company for failing to properly report emissions of uh, toxic chemicals at its Cupertino, California plant. The company was, company was required to pay uh, $47,600 in penalties and to spend $144,250 to fund a uh, project that supported local emergency response and to limit future releases from the plant. So they do have a uh, pretty good uh, carrot and a uh, stick to hit you with if you uh, don't follow through. Um, the criteria for TRI reporting is if a facility meets all three of the criteria below, it must report to the TR Toxic Release Inventory Reporting Program. It uh, is in a specific industry sector, such as manufacturing, mining, electrical power generation. It employs 10 full-time or more full-time employees or equivalent employees and it manufactures, processes, or otherwise uses a PRI-listed chemical in quantities above the threshold uh, in a given year. And for more information, certainly there's a reference here. You can take and look it up and, and find out more about the TRI reporting. And I'm going to switch over to Shen, and I'll go back on mute. Thank you, Bill. Okay, um, I'll start with the PRI listed chemicals. So there are 595 individual chemicals listed in PRI um, reporting that list by cast numbers. There are also 31 categories out of four, um, which contain 68 individual chemicals by cast numbers. So there are a difference of the reporting threshold. So for manufacturing, processing, the threshold is 25,000 pounds per year. So if you use uh, manufacturer or process more than that, you have to report TRI. And for otherwise use, the threshold is 10,000. And for PBT, that's persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic, the threshold is much lower. It's ranged from 100 pounds to 10 pounds. But dioxin, the threshold is only 0.1 gram. So if you have 0.1 gram dioxin at least, you have to report that. So for isocyanates, uh, it's really interesting. For TDI, actually TRI lists, um, lists TDI separately for the monomers, 2, 4, 2, 6, and mixed monomers. They have different cast numbers. But for other isocyanates, for diisocyanates, they are in one category. is N120. There are over 20 chemicals with each uh, cast number, including MDI. They're all lumped together into diisocyanates. So that's the difference between the MDI and TDI reporting. And in the next slide, um, I'll start with a little bit about RCAP to why we're doing that, um, doing this update. Since 2012, we have this spreadsheet version of RCAP, and there are some challenges um, in the previous version tool and also in general in the VOC or TRI reporting this procedure. So the first challenge is people are using this worst case scenario. This is not just MDI and TDI emission reporting, but quite often in the entire VOC or TRI reporting industry. By saying worst case scenario, I mean two things. So people are assuming any exhaust air are saturated with MDI or TDI vapor. Um, that's pretty common in VOC emission we'll have a fan running in your factory, then you assume all the exhaust air are saturated with that chemical. And the second worst case scenario or assumption is there's no chemical reaction occur. We know when A side is ISO, react with B side polio, um, a lot of them are reacting away. But in the traditional VOC reporting uh, practice, people don't consider that. But that's very significant for our industry, for the polyurethane industry. MDI, TDI will react with polio. So by having those two worst case scenario or assumptions, we often end up with over-reporting in PRI and also in air permit application. Sometimes that's more important. Um, by saying that there are some challenges imposed on the industry. For small business, there will be this proportionate regulatory compliance burden. Say you use MDI and TDI, 
you may not even need an air permit. So if you use that worst case scenario or assumption, um, you probably, the state agency, EPA, will have a more stringent air permit requirement on your facility. And for larger companies, it's more the reputational uh, management issue. There's a university, University of Massachusetts, they have this so-called toxic 100 air polluter index. It's entirely based on TRI data. You report more emission into TRI, your facility or your entire company will be ranked higher in that top 100 air polluter list. And that's a reputation management issue. So the entire industry, I'm sure you all know about the task, new task regulation, which was passed a few months ago. So task has, this new task has a prioritization process using PRI data. So the more the polyurethane industry report into PRI, there's a higher chance um, this industry will be regulated or perform risk assessment first. Because PRI is directly linked to exposure. Exposure combined with hazard, uh, that's the risk. So that, that's the negative impact to the industry. So specific for the 2012 archive tool, we found there are some um, issues. Some modules are not applicable for the MDI and TDI applications. So like I said before, assuming the statutory vapor approach, and we have conducted stack sampling. We never found MDI and TDI are saturated in the exhaust fan. So we need an optic tool. That's why we're doing this 2016 version. Uh, it's try to it's going to implement all the fundamental chemistry and physics. So model the emission based on the emission mechanism. So your emission should be based on your production rate, how much material you're using, what's the environmental condition in your facility instead of your exhaust fan rate. So if you are operating that exhaust fan, doesn't mean you have emission. Um, there are some other challenges. For example, um, there's some inconsistency with uh, the 2012 version regarding to emission reporting mechanisms, for example, for the spray coating. Both the federal and state EPA, they have required for spray coating application, you have to report your emission based on your spray gun transfer efficiency or the so-called fallout fraction emission estimate technique, the full feed. Um, but the previous version still assumed the saturated vapor Whenever you turn on the fan, you have emission. That's inconsistency. So that will cause either overestimating or underestimating the emission. And there's some um, lack of transparency in emission uh, algorithm selection. Uh, we've made a lot of updates to the reference in this tool. So here are the highlights of what we did in this 2016 version. So we follow the EPA emission guidelines. Uh, the majority of the emission algorithms are from the National Emission Inventory Improvement Program, the Emergency Response Program. They have specific emission calculation for certain applications. We follow those guidelines. And we were trying to move away with um, this unnecessary conservative assumption. There's still one module in there to leave that option, you can still assume every single cubic foot of air out of your facility is saturated vapor. So we don't recommend to use that. Uh, that will over-report your emission. And the third um, emission algorithm update is we focus on this reaction rate. Uh, we add some generic reaction rates between MDI, polyol, TDI, and polyol. That's the conservative assumption. That's not the fastest. By, by the most, uh, I would say, MDI and TDI reaction are catalyst specific. So this one is the slowest one we found in the literature. It doesn't mean it will represent your reaction, but that is uh, the default value. Regarding to the tool interface and coding, in addition to the guidance reference, into the module itself, like before we have a spreadsheet, we have a PDF version, have to go back and forth and check the reference. But now everything's together in the Excel database and tool. 
and we classify the application, polyurethane application, based on the fundamental emission mechanism. So whether you are using MDI and TDI in an open space or a closed space, is there any air movement around it? So that's the determination. Um, by doing that, we reduce the complexity in application module selection. In the previous two, we had 20 plus modules by application, but quite a lot of them are using the same emission algorithm, which is the saturated vapor. Uh, it's not by uh, the fundamental physics, so that's what we update there. And some um, changing in coding to increase the program efficiency. So by doing the updates, there are a few potential benefits. So we have more accurate emission reporting. Uh, I'll show some validation examples later. And you can save costs. Um, that's including the environmental consulting costs, the testing costs, the sampling costs, and also compliance costs to maintain your permit. Uh, for the industry, we're hoping this tool uh, will ensure a consistent em emission reporting for the popular thing industry. So the next section is more about the model testing and validation. I recall there's a quote, everyone trusts monitoring results except the person who does the test. But no one trusts the modeling except the person who develops the model. So that shows modeling needs validation. That's very important. So we asked around the volunteers from member companies and downstream users to test this tool. So far, our positive feedbacks. We improve the tool based on their um, input. I, uh, we really appreciate that. And we compare the modeling results with a few measurements. Within cholesterol, we help customers doing set sampling. We compare set sampling results with this model, specifically for flexible phone. I'll show some examples later. And we're going to add more um, application or catalyst the specific reaction rates. I mentioned before, the chemistry is very complicated. It's not one size fits all. So we're adding more into this module. So this slide, I just want to give you a flavor of the model validation. This is the TDI flexible phone um, manufacturer, which has two plants. So in a two-hour run in that plan B, we're comparing three options, the 2012 RCAP tool, 2016, and the stack monitoring result. You can see by assuming saturated vapor approach or every single cubic foot of exhaust air will be saturated with TDI, we're at 100, over 100 pounds of emission in two hours. And the stack sampling we measure on site using um, MDI sam uh, TDI sampling techniques is only 0.2 pounds. And using the 2016 RCAP tool is a little bit over reporting but in a ballpark, not hundreds of times higher, but only a few times higher. I'll show more for that specific example later. The so next section, I'm going to do the tool illustration. So I want to show how to choose the module and understand the emission algorithm. That's the important thing, understand the fundamental physics and chemistry, and be able to collect production-related data, how much material you're using. And then the next, the last one is you have a choice whether to use the default values or collect customized data in your facility. So when you open the software or the spreadsheet, the first page we'll see is the module selection. So it's a little bit busy, but when it's online, you'll be able to see that it's based on either open process, closed process, or some advanced modules. If you are not sure which module to choose, there's a guideline to describe um, which specific application will fit into um, the fundamental emission algorithm. There are quite a lot of selection. Uh, that saturated vapor approach is still in M6S, so we put a note, we don't recommend to use that. Okay, let's start with a theoretical example with MDI emission for open process. Say you are producing a flexible foam or any other foam with open process. You pour the ISO and mix with polio. The first step is to estimate the pseudo first order reaction rate. So by saying that is at a certain hour, you know how much ISO left 
in the phone. If you don't have that information, you don't have to really understand the chemistry. You can use the default value in that red circle. That's the conservative uh, first order reaction rate, it's about 3.6. That's based on um, after every 12 minutes, um, the half-life is, uh, is 12 minutes. So 50% of ISO will be gone. So there are a few other parameters you have to collect, like surface area, in your facility, in one year or one hour, how much foam you produce. Then you calculate the foam by the surface area, which is exposed to the air. Just don't count the bottom. The rest uh, five surface area, calculate total of them. Then you estimate how much time you want to uh, do the integration or how much time you want to count the emission. That's called the curing time. So by setting one hour, you are only capturing the first hour, hour of the emission. That's because by assuming a half-life of 12 minutes, after one hour, there's really not much left. And you have to have a rough sense of the air movement above the phone. So typical, uh, typically in, in the factory environment, one to three feet per second. So here we use 1.8. And for the temperature, since this is radical, we're only using 58 Fahrenheit. The real foam temperature will be higher. We'll have a different example later. You also have to define what's the formulation, how much MDI you use in the total formula, the MDI versus polio uh, ratio, and the monomer content of MDI. So based on an international isocyanate institute study, the vapor pressure of this MDI, polymeric MDI mixture is from monomer. So approximately uh, is proportional. So when you have the two ratio enter, um, you can calculate the total emission per hour or per year. You can also integrate your filter efficiency if you have a filter in your facility. So let's um, remember that number is 0.03 pounds per year. So I want to compare with the 2012 version. 30,000 CFM, that's very typical in a manufacturer, um, manufacturing environment. And the same temperature, same chemical formulation, and we're assuming a fan is run, running only a third of time across the year. So we're looking at 4.7 pounds. So recall from last slide, the annual emission of 20 million square feet of foam only produced 0.03 pounds. And assuming the saturated vapor approach, not a very high CFM, we're looking hundreds of times of the emission. That is because the emission is based on production rate, not your ventilation fan rate. The next example is the real example I showed that before. It's the two plants of TBI flexible foam. So the same thing, we have to enter the surface area, and in this case, we're using a higher temperature. We measure um, the surface temperature on the foam, and also we, we use the same other parameters, air velocity, reaction rate, and we're looking at about 0.6 pounds for this plant A, which is one hour run of making TDI-based flexible foam. So for this plant B is a two hour run, so it's a little bit more foam, and the rest of parameters are the same. We're looking at 1.6 pounds. And if we are using the 2012 TRI, using the saturated vapor approach, we actually measure the exhaust fan rate, the temperature of the exhaust air, and assuming the saturated PDI concentration. So you are looking at hundreds of times higher. This is because I did a rough comparison here. A typical TDI concentration from stack sampling is about 0.35 milligram per cubic meter at 90 Fahrenheit. But the saturated PDI concentration is 250, so 700 times higher. If you are using, uh, assuming the saturated TDI concentration, you will be way over reporting. That's the nature of the, the chemistry or the physics. Okay, so the two previous slide uh, examples are open process. Then let's look at a closed system. Um, so the closed system, you still have to know all the formulation information and you have to enter the weight percentage 
um, of MBI monomer, and also how much material you use every year. The difference between the 2012 and 2016 is 2012 assume the whole cavity will be saturated with MDI or TBI. So this update only assume a portion of that, because when you fill the raw material, only a portion of the air or the, the cavity is still uh, air. So that only that portion of air will be saturated with MDI or TBI. That's a reduction of the reportable emissions. Like I said there here, not entire volume of the closed phase is saturated, only a portion of that. That's a closed system. The next example is the tank emission. That's very straightforward from EPA reporting guideline. You have a working loss, that means um, when you fill the tank with raw material, um, you can calculate based on the throughput volume of how much MBI TPI fill the tank, then calculate the total emissions. And so freezing loss, that's when the temperature change, there's some loss from the tank. You just need to know the throughput volume and also temperature change for the freezing loss. That's very straightforward. There is a reference and guidance of equations in the spreadsheet. So the next example is the fuel emissions we from, from equipment mix. We change that based on the logic from EPA um, guidance. So EPA says you have to have a screening value in order to use the correlation approach. And this is the decision tree. So if you have if you don't have the screening value, you have to go with average emission factor approach. We'll see how much that is different. And if you have the screening value, that means you have a monitoring device around that equipment, try to measure NDI or TDI, um, or do some preliminary sampling. So if that screening value is zero, or at the same level as the background level, then you can use the default zero uh, emission rate approach. It's a different set of emission factors. So if you have a um, screening value, then you can do the correlation approach. So here is the example without screening value. So let's say we have all the different kind of equipment and one of each. So the emission factor is very high. Without screening value, without doing the preliminary sampling, you are looking at over 480 pounds of emission. And you can adjust that by having some control. So there's valve equipment modification, pump modification. So we integrate into the different control mechanisms. That will reduce uh, the reportable emissions if you don't have any screening value from the equipment leak, potential equipment leak. And if you have a screening value, then let's say 20 ppb, that's the threshold value of a uh, short-term exposure. So you are only looking at 0.03 pounds. That shows how important this screening value is. So we would recommend if you want to report fugitive emission from equipment leaks, definitely get a screening value. Otherwise, it will be over-reporting too. Yep, that's all the examples. So I go much quicker than I thought. But CPI and us, we really appreciate all the comments from the volunteers who will test this tool. Yep, thank you. And if you have any questions, maybe you can open the floor. Thanks.